Good evening, citizens of Portsmouth and my colleagues on council. I call to order the public work session for Tuesday, October 26, 2021. And Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes. Mr. Battle. Here. Mrs. Lucas Burke. Here. Mr. Moody. Here. Dr. Whitaker. Mr. Woodard. Mayor Glover. Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Madam City Manager. You have the floor, ma'am. Yes. First presentation, uh, City Council has requested information regarding the departments on the fourth floor of City Hall, specifically planning, engineering, and technical services, and permits and inspections. Tonight, City Council will receive a detailed briefing on the responsibilities of those departments. In addition, the presentation will provide a generalized overview of the development review process steps leading from an undeveloped site to a newly constructed building with a certificate of occupancy. Deputy City Manager Bob Baldwin will start the presentation and he will be followed by City Engineer James Wright as well as the building official Doug Smith respectively. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Baldwin, welcome, sir. Thank you, and good evening, uh, Mayor Glover, members of City Council. Certainly our pleasure to uh, provide this briefing for you tonight. Hopefully it will uh, be informative and maybe um, um, advise you of some things you may not be aware of that, that go on on the fourth floor in addition to the things you are aware of and see. Um, purpose of the briefing tonight, as you can see from the slide we're on here, really give you an overview of our, the functions and services that are provided by the departments on the fourth floor. Um, that, again, those three departments the city manager mentioned. We'll go over our responsibilities regarding land use, uh, a lot of the regulations regarding environmental protection. Um, we'll discuss um, our flood regulations. We'll discuss resilience, um, Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act requirements, stormwater management, some of the things with climate change, things that are on the horizon for us. We will also talk about our, what we call development services. This is really our plan reviewing processes, leading people to get permits. We'll talk about our responsibilities for regulatory compliance, most of those being mandated down from the federal and state governments to the city. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the things we do in terms of um, regional collaboration. So that'll be sort of the purpose of the briefing here. Next slide, please. So starting off, just to give you, we're gonna kind of try to break this down into three, um, three blocks. Um, the processes we use um, don't really operate one at a, one at a time. They, they quite often are done um, in, a, in a fashion in which things are overlapping. But basically, for the purpose of trying to provide you know, sort of a clear um, uh, presentation this evening, we'll break it down into these three uh, blocks you see on the slide before you. We'll talk about the planning and zoning piece. And for people involved in the development process and development review process, that's generally where they're going to start. And that gets into the questions about, you know, what am I going to do? You know, what do I want to do? Uh, where's my property located? And those kind of questions trigger a lot of the regulatory requirements. They're usually location-based and they're use-based. And so uh, depending on, on what the, um, uh, the customer or the applicant's intentions are, where they're located will quite often uh, determine what the regulatory requirements will be for them. And we'll follow that up with the engineering piece, which is what Thing most people would refer to as our site plan process for people who are building new, new construction or significant um, new construction additions. Um, they have to go through our site plan process uh, as part of land disturbance, um, site preparation, that goes into parking and landscaping and screening and all those stormwater functions we'll talk about. And then finally, we'll go through the last piece of it, really the permits and inspections piece. That's the building piece. That's where people get their building permits get their building plans approved, they construct, they're inspected, uh, all of those types of things. So uh, we will go through that part of the process. We'll just mention too, when you get into some of these larger processes like the site plan process, this is just not a function of the fourth floor. This is a collaborative process across uh, multiple city departments. For example, the Public Utilities Department is a major player in a lot of these site plan review processes, things of that nature. So again, I'll just start off, I think just for simplicity's sake, the zoning piece, first piece, and that's where um, uh, most people when they come in the door, they want to sit down and talk to somebody either in zoning or somebody at least knows zoning uh, when they come to the planning department. And so next slide please. Again, this is our uh, part of our development approval process, and we're going to talk a little bit about zoning. We'll talk about our zoning authority, what we do, how we do it, and the authorities we have. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, 
I always start off with this slide. A lot of people find it kind of dry, but it's really important for us. Talk about the city's um, local planning authority, and we're a Dillon Rule state, and I think most of the council members are aware of what that means, but uh, for the public, um, when you're a Dillon Rule state, this is, a, this is a doctrine that goes back to the late 1800s. It's about the relationship between state and local governments, and it basically states that localities only have the authority that has been expressly provided to it by the state, and if you have to interpret it and, and it's not reasonable what you're asking for, you have to presume you do not have the authority. So it's a very constricted amount of authority. So it, it applies quite regularly when we're dealing with zoning issues when people want you to like waive a requirement or modify a requirement. And unless the General Assembly is given the um, zoning administrator authority to do things of that nature, we're simply not permitted to do that. So that all comes under that um, Dillon Rule doctrine. And so uh, that was actually, um, as I understand it, um, has been in, in place in, in Virginia since the late 18, in the late 1800s. So it's a long-standing um, um, concept. I think a lot of people, including our city manager, has worked in places where they have uh, home rule. It's quite different, the amount of authority localities get in home rule states. Uh, but we are in Virginia, and we have a very restricted uh, amount of authority, um, again, based on what the General Assembly has decided we're allowed to have. Next slide, please. I'm sure city council is all aware. We'll start off again on our zoning piece. Um, this is something you're all familiar with. Uh, you see these applications come before you. The zoning authority has also been uh, incorporated into the state uh, code and, and what we call our enabling legislation. It dictates from the state how we go about doing zoning. Um, and basically, this is where we establish zoning districts. We establish zoning regulations, where buildings can be, how big they can be, how tall they can be, all the other development requirements. That's all under the authority under um, zoning. That also appeal, applies to all of those uses. And for those of you who have taken a look in our zoning ordinance, you see we've got a fairly lengthy use table. That's where that's all spelled out in the use table, whether it's not allowed, whether it's a permitted by right use, whether there's a use permit requirement, things of that nature. So that's all under that use authority. And that's in 15.2.2280 of the state code, if you want to look that up for some late night reading. Um, but that's our authority to do zoning. Of course. The, Next slide, please. So, Mr. Baldwin. Yes, sir. Hold a minute, sir. Dr. Whitaker, yeah, sir. I just, I just have a question for council. Is, is this presentation based on a request from one of our council members? W which presentation is that, sir? Th this, this 42 page presentation. That, that presentation, Madam City Manager, do you want to address that, please? Yes, that was a, a request from Vice Mayor Barnes where there were no objections from council um, to bring this presentation presentation to the council during this meeting. Okay, was it pertaining to the issues of the fourth floor or it's just, just said, an overview of all just, the planning? It said fourth floor, yes. You may okay. continue, sir. All right, so again, the way the zoning authority works is a combination of the regulations which are in text. That's our zoning ordinance that you're all familiar with. That's matched up with the zoning map, which city council also adopts as it does the zoning ordinance. You match the two up, you determine what the, where the property is, what its zoning district is, which shows on the zoning map. You match that up with the zoning regulations. And that's the basis uh, across the country, really, of how zoning is done. It's pretty straightforward. It's the combination between the map and the text. And so that's the way that's done. Next slide, please. Now we have a number of other city codes that are related to, to our zoning authority. Um, we do flood protection. As you know, we're, you're all familiar with our uh, FEMA um, flood insurance program, our flood protection program. That's also in the city code. It's an overlay district in zoning. So you apply the um, flood regulations on top of the regular zoning. So there's a map basically showing the flood hazard areas. Uh, we manage that program in the planning department. Um, Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, that's also a, an overlay district on the zoning. It has its own chapter of city code. That also operates as, a, as an overlay district in zoning. So. As you can, if you, if you go back to that previously, look in there, depending on where your property is located, someone may find themselves both in a flood hazard area, they might also be in the Chesapeake Bay area, in addition to all the other um, zoning regulations. So that's when we start trying to figure out exactly all the regulations that might apply to a specific person, what they want to do and where they're located. Uh, next slide. Uh, you're also familiar with historic districts. These are um, designated by city council, we have five. Uh, state code requires for us to apply historic district requirements. They must be designated and adopted by city council. So these have been in place for a number of decades. Uh, that outlines the, the location. Each one of those is a district, has their own set of regulations. These are 
uh, the only districts in addition to our downtown design district in which we are allowed to regulate building materials, uh, building design types. State code is pretty specific. In uh, typical residential districts, you cannot be dictating uh, what the building looks like. The state sets minimum standards. That's what the zone is, unless you're in a historic district or unless you're in a, uh, a city council adopted a, a local historic district. And that's where you have the authority to apply those um, historic district design requirements. And that's where you have your historic preservation commission, city council appoints, and your downtown design committee, same thing. That operates under the same state code authority. And we just provide you another, another sort of a close up of another zoning map. It's a little different zoning downtown, but you can see the different districts downtown. So some people say, how come the zoning looks different from my property, somebody else's property? Because the zoning can change, obviously, depending on where you're located. So it's just an example of that. Next slide, please. Now, I kind of quickly go through all the different things that um, happen in the planning department. Um, this, this chart here kind of uh, tries to summarize in a, in a way uh, all the different um, uh, activities that happen in the planning department. The ones we're primarily talking about this evening are those, we'll start at the top, the zoning piece, which has to do with zoning permitting, uh, people getting zoning for business licenses, zoning verifications. We have another request for letters, banks, refinancing, people want uh, zoning verification. We operate the Board of Zoning Appeals through that function, and we coordinate with permits and inspections on zoning violations, and that's a joint activity between the two departments. City Council's very um, familiar with the current planning piece. It's in the gray box right there, a gray circle, where you see your use permits, rezonings, code amendments, street closures, street name changes. All of those require City Council approval. Um, and then, of course, we have the, under that uh, code compliance, we picked up those other uh, overlay districts we mentioned earlier, the Chessie Bay. We also operate Wetlands Board, uh, the flood um, regulations, subdividing of property. Uh, we do permitting for food trucks, um, and we do special permits, and we'll talk about uh, some of those in a, little, in, a, in a little bit. We also participate in site plan review. Um, site plan review process is, is, is handled through engineering, but it's authorized under the zoning ordinance, and so it's picked up over here. And then a number of things we do, we um, manage the city's home and community development block grant program. We have five boards and commissions that um, are staffed by the planning uh, department. Um, we do all the city's long range planning, for example, the comprehensive plan. Um, we do resilience planning. We staff the uh, complete count uh, commission for the census. Um, and we've done joint land use study with the city of Chesapeake and the Navy. That's a, a process that's about to, to conclude. Um, we have a very active transportation planning element in the planning department um, where we do, we've just completed about a year or so ago, the bike and pedestrian plan. We have a, a the city's master transportation plan that's due for updating. We work with HRT on ferry improvements, um, bus shelters, um, and we're also involved in, in uh, uh, sort of ongoing discussions about using scooters and bike share and all of those things. We have not had any successful um, go through the RFP process a couple of times. We've not had any uh, one actually go all the way through the process, but I think that's a COVID-related lack of activity at that point, but down the road, we're likely to see that. And then we also work through regional committees on transportation. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission. They're the ones who funded the HRBT widening, um, the widening of 64 up through the peninsula. Uh, we uh, operate, we participate in, in uh, these technical groups, the TTAC, that's the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, the FTAC, which is the free, Freight Transportation Advisory Committee, and HRT. So the Planning Department has a whole robust plate of things it does. And we go to the next slide. Just very quickly, this is a staff, a total of 15 people in the Planning Department. Um, on the right, we just list some professional certifications. We're very fortunate, we've got three staff members that are certified as certified um, zoning administrators. Um, we have one certified zoning officer. And then we have a number of folks who are like myself, AICP, which is the American Institute of Certified Planners. It's kind of the, the high level um, certification for planners. We have uh, floodplain managers. We keep a notary public on staff in case people have to get documents signed. So we try to be uh, as well trained and well versed in, uh, in, in all of our requirements as we can be. Next slide, please. And then we thought we'd run through some of our statistics, show kind of the activities of the planning department. And this slide, I think, is kind of interesting. If you look at it for the three years in this sense, if you look at 2019, that's a pre-COVID year. 
City Hall was open, no restrictions on people coming in. Um, you can see the number of uh, the permits and approvals that went through the department during 2019. And I'm just gonna point you down into the zoning permits. There were 1,095, and you see there was 803 business license clearances. Those are all zoning permits. So you had a little, almost uh, a little over 1,900, or near 1,900 there. You go to 2020, as you are well aware, City Hall closed in March. We had nine months where the planning department converted itself from paper to virtual. Everything that, that's done in the planning department can now be done virtually. Um, with the exception of subdivision plats will still have to be physically signed so they can be recorded in the courthouse. And I think if you take a look at the numbers, you'll see you don't see a whole lot of difference in those numbers. In fact, see the number of zoning permits went up. Those are related to construction. Uh, business license clearances went down. I think we all know the economy took a little bit of a dip during uh, uh, the, during the primary part of COVID when everyone was closed. But the department stayed fully functional. We did not close one day during COVID. Um, so when, when the city was functioning, the planning department was operating. Even though we were virtual, people were teleworking, but we kept up our work. And one thing I just point out at the very bottom sl uh, of the slide, special permits. And these are people get permits for parades, um, public assemblies, outdoor dining permits. You can see there was a, quite a dip there in 2020. That's when the governor declared that public assemblies had to be shrunken down to small numbers, and so we lost many of those. If you look over to 2021, this is just through the very the beginning of October, the 2021 number, so it's a little over uh, nine months. You can see we're already exceeding the pace of what we had in previous years, and you can see the special permit activity has picked back up again as people are being allowed again to congregate and kind of get back together. So I think they're pretty clear evidence of the amount of, of activity that goes in the department, the number of permits and approvals that, that go through there um, every year, certainly busy every day. Next slide, please. Excuse me, Mr. Baldwin. Yes, I have sir. to step away for a minute. You can continue your presentation. Okay, certainly. Um, so that's the planning side. So just to go back to the development review process, I indicated a lot of times what it will start off, someone will come in, they want to have a certain kind of a business, so they want to build a certain type of thing. Um, for those that are novices at it or not regular customers, they, they'll typically call in, we'll have some conversation with them, try to get some information about what it is they're trying to do. Once we work through the, the, the um, requirements under zoning and determine what they want to do and what they're allowed to do for new construction, they will then move from the zoning process into the site plan process when they start to develop their plans for construction for that. So with that, I'm um, going to step away, let Mr. Wright come in. He's going to walk through the site plan process. This is really one of the, the major components of our development review program. So Mr. Wright is going to give that part of the process, uh, part of the process here. If, if it's um, okay with council, um, I think we can kind of skip this presentation and go to the questions. Then if anybody have any specific questions. You want to hear? Okay. Okay, good evening, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council. So, um, the Department of Engineering and Technical Services coordinates the technical review for site plans. Um, after site plan approval, we issue a number of permits and receive bonds as required um, and conduct the necessary inspections related to those permits. Next slide. So, this is the number of activities that take place in the Department of Engineering and Technical Services. Um, technical services include the role that we play in the development process. Um, we provide technical assistance to other departments and we maintain the city construction standards. Um, development services include site plan review and subdivision review. Um, we play a regulatory role that extends to the right of way, stormwater compliance, Chesapeake Bay preservation areas, and traffic control plans. The environmental programs that we administer are subject to state and federal audit. Um, we routinely issue permits for various construction-related activities and hold bonds as required for those activities. A significant portion of our time is dedicated to project management from engineering studies to project scoping, to planning, to design, to construction, inspection, and closeout. Um, the city has a stormwater permit, which is issued by DEQ and enforced by EPA. Um, the Stormwater Compliance Division sits within this department and we're responsible for ensuring that all permit-relating activities are conducted in accordance with the permit and that they are properly documented for our annual report. We, we participate in numerous regional committees at the Planning District Commission 
in order to stay abreast of issues that may impact the city as they, as they relate to um, impacts as far as roadways, environmental concerns. And we also um, are there to take advantage of any funding opportunities that may become available. Um, with respect to our transportation program, we're responsible for the city's local assistance program where the majority of our transportation projects are coordinated and funded through VDOT. Next slide, please. Um, this slide just shows the, the technical staff in the department and the various professional licenses and certifications that they hold. Um, please note that DEQ mandates the various state issued certifications for the individuals in the Stormwater Compliance Division. Next slide, please. So, site plan review. Site plan review is intended to promote the orderly development, evaluate and mitigate significant environmental impacts, promote public safety and general welfare by ensuring that development projects are properly related to their sites, surrounding properties, traffic circulation, water and sewers, drainage and other infrastructure. Um, the vast majority of site plans fall into two categories, the major site plan and single family site plans. Uh, minor site plans are typically those projects that don't require all the full components of a full-blown major site plan submittal. Um, site plan review coordinate process, as Mr. Bowen mentioned, is coordinated through our department. Site plans are submitted to our department and then routed to the various departments that are involved in site plan review. Um, we get those comments back, um, coordinate them and, and, and put them in a letter and get those letters out. Uh, those review letters out to the applicant's engineer and also to the um, owner who's listed actually on the site plan and subsequent reviews are handled in the same manner. Next slide. So um, site plan consists of multiple required components. Each one of those plan components you see listed on the left has its own subcomponents and own set of requirements and generally speaking so the required site plan components are associated with those city code sections you see there on the right. Um, the environmental ordinances, the first four you see there, Chesapeake Bay Overlay District, erosion sediment control, flood protection and stormwater management are all model state ordinances. So they're exactly the same ordinance that there are in this state. And those ordinances are based in federal regulations. Um, our site plan requirements are listed on the city website. Next slide, please. So um, layered into the site plan components and reference ordinance are the various regulatory standards um, that are associated with the various program activities that require checks for compliance during that review. Um, these programs and regulations have oversight by agencies such as Department of Environmental Quality and the Virginia Department of Health. Um, you see a few of those there with the Stormwater Management Program, BMP Clearinghouse, um, Sewage Collection and Treatment Regs, and water rest regulation. Other standards um, are set forth by Federal Highway Administration, um, American uh, Disabilities Act, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control criteria, and um, they're intended to promote safe, consistent roadway infrastructure. Um, the, another important thing to note on this slide is that um, site plans need to be signed and sealed by a professional engineer or a licensed 3B surveyor, surveyor licensed to practice in the state of Virginia. Next slide, please. So people often ask, um, what are the requirements for time review as it pertains to site plans? And so this is directly uh, from the, the state code. So the first step is to determine the completeness within 15 calendar days receipt of the site plan. If it's determined to be incomplete, then the applicant shall be notified in writing indicated the reasons that the plan is deemed incomplete. If determined complete, then an additional 60 days from the date that the communication is made with the applicant that the plan is determined complete is allowed for the plan review. If a determination is not made, then the plan will be deemed complete as of the date of submission and a total of 60 days from the date of submission will be allowed for the plan review. The plan approving authority shall review within 45 calendar days of the date of resubmission of any plan that has been previously disapproved. And these guidelines are consistent throughout several um, articles of regulation. This is the, the primary state code, but it's also found um, in stormwater regs and a couple other regulations throughout the state code. Next slide, please. So um, from January 2014 through September 2020, 2021, um, there have been 209 site plans submitted for review. 
173 of those have been approved. 20 site plans are still active and in site plan review. Um, when applicants come in and ask about site plan process and how long will it take for me to get a response, we typically tell them it'll take about four to six, six weeks. Um, mind you, if you go back to the last slide, um, it's either 15 days uh, to determine that it's complete, then an additional 60. So it's 75 days if it's determined complete. If it's not determined complete and no communication is made, uh, that's another, that's 60 days. So it's either 60 days or 75 days. Um, we tell applicants four to six weeks. Um, note the initial, uh, after that initial letter is received uh, from the applicant, um, the developer and their team is responsible for the schedule. So once they get that letter from our department, the schedule's in their hands about how long it takes them to get the responses corrected, get the plan adjusted, and get the plan back into the department. We don't have any control over that other than making ourselves available um, for the applicant and their engineer as they call and contact us with questions. Um, site plan submittal varies by project, and each subsequent response um, is based on the completeness and thoroughness of the revised plan set. The number of submittals is largely dependent on the complexity of the project. Um, comments made on a site plan submission may require plan changes that affect multiple regulations or departments. And um, just a couple of examples. Um, if there's a comment on a landscape buffer that impacts the parking lot, um, that's likely going to impact the drainage design and stormwater management requirements. And so you have multiple plan components that could be impacted that require additional reviews when they resubmit that plan back in for, for review. Um, the proximity of proposed pipelines to, to building foundations may require shifting um, of, of features on site, which may bring in an additional components of plan review. Um, if a plan needs coordination with another agency, such as VDOT or the Corps of Engineers, that extends a timeline and also um, in, introduces some complexities into the project. Um, as you see here, the, the average time for the city to respond um, for site plans is right around 20, 23 or so odd days. Um, 25 for the first submittal, 22 for the second submittal, 23 for the third, 19 for the fourth, and 14 for the fifth. And once again, those complexities um, and, and timelines are, are based on, on those reviews that come back to us. Um, next slide, please. So um, as requested, um, here's how we uh, stack up to the rest of localities in the region. Um, oh, skip one, sorry. So yeah, so uh, with this slide, um, approximately 86% of the plans are approved in, in three submittals. Um, it is not impossible to get a plan approved in the first submittal. Uh, during that time frame, 40 plans have been, been approved uh, on the first submittal. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. So this is how we stack up to our neighbors. Uh, we're about in the middle, somewhere near the top. Uh, see Chesapeake at 21, which is the low. Suffolk at 30, which is the highest. And we're at 26 days. And this is the, the compiled uh, review times from initial to subsequent recent medals. Next slide, please. So um, this slide shows uh, some data from our single family residential site plan approval process. Um, in 2017, the department heads on the fourth floor started to have discussions about how we could improve our process. Um, there were difficulties with applicants uh, coming up and experiencing, um, for lack of a better word, headaches um, getting through that process. So um, at that time, applicants basically had to come in uh, with their packet, go from department to department, take several trips back and forth to City Hall. Um, it, was, it, was, it was tedious and worrying on applicants and developers and worrying on staff. And so um, we got together, uh, got our heads together to, to talk about what we could do to make the, to streamline the process and make it a little bit more efficient. Um, we took a year. Um, the department heads, the, the team that reviews those plans, um, we revamped our application process, we revamped the process, um, put things in place to make the process more efficient. We took a six-month time period with a uh, local home builder to, to test the process um, so we could tweak it and, and work it before going live. And in 2019, we went live. 
uh, with the stated goal to basically turn around uh, single family uh, projects within five days. Um, now what happens is an applicant submits their package to the zoning department to get their zoning clearance. Um, once that clearance is received, that, that packet is transmitted, transmitted to the engineering department um, for, uh, for a start of that single family process, which is a, um, a combined process where the building department is looking at the things they need to look at, engineering department is looking at things we need to look at. Um, it's a coordinated review. Um, the applicant um, either can come in and drop their packet off or submit electronically. But unless there's an issue with the packet that they submit, the only time that they're contacted um, or have to come into the building is to basically get their permits once everything's approved. Um, two things to note here. Um, if you look at the number of applications returned, uh, 2021, um, it, we've worked our way through the process with app so that the process is clear. We're not having to return applications to the applicants. And if you go down to the column, average days for approval with out outliers, um, four days, which means we're meeting our target. So um, this is just one process of how we uh, work together as a team on the fourth floor to try to help developers. Um, next slide, please. So um, some of the challenges during site plan review. Um, in 2013, uh, the Virginia Stormwater Management Program and all its components were transferred from the Department of Conservation and Recreation to the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, this move uh, indicated a shift from uh, local assistance to more of an oversight regulatory standpoint from the state. Um, all localities in the Commonwealth holding stormwater permits were mandated in 2014 to adopt the Virginia Stormwater Management Program. Um, this new program comes with more robust and very specific design standards for drainage, flood protection, channel protection and BMPs that are intended to protect the environment. Um, while it was the stated goal of these regulations um, in 2011 to, enter, to fully integrate these components, stormwater management, Chesapeake Bay preservation areas, erosion sediment control and flood protection, um, to this date they have yet to be fully integrated. Um, despite multiple bills um, to the General Assembly to do so, Despite state funding set aside um, to provide consultant assistance to DEQ, um, basically that was uh, spawned or, or, or came out of the legislative package that we sent a few years back, um, it still has not moved forward. And these uh, non-integrated ordinances cause issues at a staff level and also for developers because um, there are a number of criteria uh, that overlapped and, and, and conflict, and, and if they were fully integrated, it would be a seamless, more streamlined approach to be able to communicate um, those regulations and requirements um, to the development community. Um, another thing to, to take note there um, is that back in 2014, which is why it causes such heartache uh, for developers, um, when these programs were, were mandated by the state, it, the, the cost in 2014 alone, construction costs were stated to increase by 40%. So um, you multiply that out to current year and you're talking about a tremendous cost uh, for stormwater management for projects. Um, case in point, some of the larger transportation projects um, have had to come back and do tremendous retrofits um, because they did not consider um, stormwater management. If you take, I think, the second phase of widening of 64, they had to come back and do some significant stormwater management for, for whatever reason. It, it seemed to have been left out initially at a, at a tremendous cost to come back and do that. Um, locality uh, program staff required to have various certifications and mandated um, by the state in order to promote consistency in the interpretation of application for those regulations. Um, outside of the, that program staff, there's no requirement for any certifications or any training for the stormwater management program. And it is a new program, even though it's been in place since 2014. Stormwater is not stormwater the way it used to be um, back in the, in the early 2000s, back in the 90s, back in the 80s. So um, if you're not up to speed, getting through stormwater management is going to be a challenge. Um, as far as Ches Bay, land disturbance in areas for areas in the CVPA areas is uh, cumulative, not to be segmented. 
um, that what that basically means is you we have a threshold of 2,500 uh, square feet. You can't go 2,499, 2,499, 2,499, and come in and think you're going to get around the regulations. Um, it's a cumulative impact. So all those small projects that add up over 2,500, then you're you're into the site plan process and you're into all those regulations. Um, small land disturbances within in buffer zones um, shall be mitigated as mandated by the state. Um, individual land work pilings for piers are counted as land disturbance. Um, so if you have that small footprint of a pier going in on your property, you have to mitigate for that because of the buffer area that you're in. And it was a finding uh, in one of the audits uh, that we received, um, I think, within the past two years. Um, and so we've added that requirement to, to our review to ensure that people are following through. Um, if your buffer areas and, and, and wetlands are, if you're unsure of where they are on your property and it's not mapped out, you have to actually get a certified, deline a certified delineation, and those delineations are good for five years. Um, if you don't have a uh, delineation, you have to go out and find someone to get that delineation. It um, has to be verified by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, if, you're, if your delineation is over five years old, you have to go get a new one, and sometimes that causes hang-ups. But you see um, here the planning department has done a couple of recent uh, updates here, modifications um, to, to some areas uh, when they updated their zoning ordinance. And the Department of Utilities is currently still um, looking over their uh, water connection policy. Um, just to briefly go over it, it is a complicated process, and we do our best to try to work with uh, applicants, provide those materials to help get them through the process. And I'll turn it over to the building official. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Mayor, <clears throat> excuse me. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, my name is Doug Smith and I am your building and code official. Um, so I will be giving the uh, presentation tonight on permits and inspections and the overview of what we do. Slide, please. Um, the building division of permits and inspections is really in, uh, in charge of the building inspection component and the permit issuing component. So what we do is we vet permit applications, uh, perform plans examination, issue permits, perform construction inspections, and issue certificates of uh, occupancy. Slide. Uh, the um, Uniform Statewide Building Code is a state statute um, provided by, in the Code of Virginia, it supersedes all local building regulations and codes affected by political subdivisions. Uh, it prohibits local amendments to the building code and it prohibits waiver of building regulations and code provisions. Slide. Um, the purpose of the code is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the communities and citizens and the general public in the constructed environments, to provide minimum recognized construction standards, and to allow the uh, structures to be built at the least possible cost. Slide. The uh, uh, Uniform Statewide Building Code is comprised of three parts. It's 10 codes, it's five uh, Virginia building and fire code uh, related regulations, and over a thousand reference standards. Slide. Uh, part one of the Uniform Statewide Building Code is comprised of the Virginia Construction Code and the Virginia Residential Code. These codes are uh, what are used for newly constructed buildings. The Virginia Existing Building Code is the code that is used by default um, on any alterations, modifications, and so forth to an existing building. Uh, and the Virginia Maintenance Code is the uh, code under which uh, we enforce code, in, uh, code enforcement measures throughout the city, whether it be um, dilapidated structures and so forth. Um, 
we use the uh, property maintenance code as the enforcement um, measure. The um, various codes that we um, enforce, you can see that's a quite, it's quite an extensive uh, library uh, slide, and it, pre and it and includes the mechanical, plumbing, fuel, gas, um, and the energy conservation codes, the fire prevention code, the uh, property maintenance code, the existing building code, and the residential and uh, Virginia construction codes, as well as the electric code. Slide. Um, the uh, local building department is mandated by state statute uh, that each local jurisdiction, jurisdiction has to have a building department. Uh, it also mandates that each, each building department is permanent, is, uh, permanently, has a permanently appointed building official as the executive in charge uh, of the department. Uh, and it allows each building official to delegate authority to technical assistance, which is uh, basically what you would know as the inspectors or uh, permit technicians. Slide. The, um, the power and duty of the building department and the building official, uh, we have the sole uh, statutory and regulatory administrative and enforcement authority we administrate and enforce the USBC consistently and equitably. We interpret and apply the USBC consistently and equitably. And uh, something that's not on this slide, it is imperative that we um, enforce the code in accordance with the, uh, uh, the interpretation of the Virginia State Technical Review Board. Um, we establish uh, processes and procedures to administrate the codes and we delegate authority accordingly to our technical assistants, which have to be properly credentialed. Slide. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we have uh, a permit applicant. We our responsibility includes permit application and processing, and in so doing, it's permit administration, plans examination, construction inspection, and issuance of certificates of occupancy. Slide. Um, the building official and all the technical assistants have um, copious numbers of uh, credentials, certifications, and so forth provided both internationally, nationally, and uh, by the state. Um, most of us have uh, several different um, certifications as well, and many of these that are shown um, by these positions incorporate um, a large number of individual certifications. Slide. Um, we were requested to provide uh, turnaround times for our neighboring localities as well as the city of Portsmouth. Um, as you can see here, uh, the city of Portsmouth today, our turnaround time for commercial plans uh, and uh, residential plans is about 10 business days. That equates to about two weeks. Uh, and when we get a, um, a second submittal, uh, we usually get those turned out within five business days. Uh, as you can see, uh, several of our neighboring localities, um, that timeline is, is extended out for pretty good, pretty good ways. Um, we are very fortunate right now that we have been working diligently over the last year to reduce what, and, and I, I don't like to admit this, but we were out there about 10 weeks uh, a year ago, and we've reduced that time down to two weeks. We all have the same problems, um, and that's staffing. F uh, finding and hiring plans examiners is an extraordinarily difficult thing. Many of our neighboring localities simply don't have that staff right now. Slide. Um, some of the larger projects that we've been working on uh, over the last year, um, we have the Churchland Commons condos, Holly Points apartments, uh, the lineage cold uh, storage facility out in West Norfolk, uh, ocean storage, Crofton warehouse, um, and uh, various sports bars. We have a number of those, uh, and the Wawa, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We have uh, performed approximately 
1,200 uh, plan reviews in 21, and so far this fiscal year in this first quarter, we've pre uh, performed um, about uh, about 600. Slide. Okay. Um, this shows that um, over the last year we generally we issue approximately between four and five thousand permits a year that's been pretty consistent um, so far this year we've got uh, about uh, a little over I believe that's 1200 uh, permits that we've issued so far this year slide and then um, our inspections by trade we generally perform uh, somewhere between nine and ten thousand inspections um, a year, and so far we've uh, um, performed about uh, twenty-eight hundred inspections. Let me see. Let me confirm that. I can't read that as well as I wish I could. Yes, about um, twenty-four hundred inspections so far this year slide okay and now I'll turn this back over to Bob uh, 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 would anybody like to ask a question council member Moody you have the floor sir Th thank you for the presentation mr. Smith uh, on the uh, inspections that do we do all of those in-house yes we do. Okay. There was a time when um, we um, contracted out inspections, but we perform all of those now. Okay, so we, we don't uh, outsource any of our inspections? None of our inspections. I will tell you that um, we were in trying to get over the, the problem that we were having with plans review and getting our projects turned over. Not only were we fortunate enough to hire additional staff as plans examiners and we're getting them trained up now, um, we've cut down tremendously on that turnaround time. But the other thing that we did was to um, contract with a third party plans examination um, company. And um, they've been very helpful on some pretty big projects, including the uh, casino. So. So, so you think we, we're well uh, situated to uh, uh, take care of the uh, workload that's going to uh, result from the casino? Oh, yes. Yes, I've already taken the, the uh, steps to make sure that that's going to be handled. Um, we have the third submittal of the casino documents, I believe is the 12th of November. And... I'm, I am going to be um, uh, farming out the inspections for the casino as well. So there will be a third party conducting those inspections. I met with them last week. So their their inspections will be outsourced? So, yes. Okay. Why, why is that? Well, quite frankly, I didn't want to have anything um, that would interfere with that project, slow it down in any way. And the other component is many of our inspectors only have a couple of years of experience. And while I'm getting them trained up, um, I wanted to bring in people that were very experienced in large projects and complicated projects like that. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Is there anything else? Council Member Battle, sir, you have the floor. I'm sorry, sir. This is dealing with our water system. Do we have the staff persons certified to tell us whether we have problems with our water system? Not with my department, sir. Well, we have questions. Okay. Yes, sir. You're a team, right? Right. I Sir, so um, you're speaking of public utilities. So um, the the water uh, is sampled daily uh, in the water system, and those test results are um, 
Excuse Cap, that's me. A, Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, sir. Maybe he didn't understand the question. Um, I'm not talking about the water uh, testing. I understand that principle. Um, may I state the question to him again? By all means, sir. Thank you. Again, do we have the staff persons who are certified to let us know when we have problems with our water system? And yes, are they certified to inspect and oversee these repairs? Yes, you currently have um, the, the interim director who is a licensed engineer. Um, you have the um, operations manager who's, a, who's another um, licensed engineer. Um, you have inspection staff. Um, you have um, operations um, in both um, for the water distribution system. You have operations for um, sewage collection. You have operations for um, pump stations. And then you have a whole suite of certified individuals at the treatment plant. Can they oversee uh, and troubleshoot problems and oversee the corrections of the problems? And can they pre-pronounce through site and equipment performance when we're going to have a problem? That's a yes and no. And so it depends on um, what exactly um, you're talking about. So you have an older system. Um, come, come winter time, um, you have freeze and thaw cycles, so you don't know when you're going to have a main break. Um, you have older systems, you don't know when necessarily they're going to collapse. Um, as far as having a, a sewer cave in and such, um, you do have equipment um, such, as, such as monitoring equipment inside pump stations that can tell you um, how pump stations are operating um, based on their um, experience with the system. They can have some idea to be able to predict um, when certain systems are going to need to be replaced or and repaired based on um, repair, repair records, repair logs. Um, system complaints and things of that nature. So um, that is why I said yes and, and no. So, it, so some of it's variable, some of it's not. But the, those things that are variable usually are things that can be handled promptly in most cases. Yeah, so in, in most cases what you typically have is you have them come out and do whatever repair, or whatever tasks they need to do to get the system up and operational so that there's no downtime or, 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 or significant downtime experience by the customer. So theoretically, our staff could do an overview and give us a description or a interpretation of how much we're talking about to uh, put our system in a better position than it's in now. Mr. Battle, um, th this particular, you, we certainly appreciate your question, but this, this particular- Well, while you are disturbing well, me- I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm disturbing you, I'm, sir, sir, Mr. sir. Mr. Mayor, that is total totally disrespectful sir sir what i'm trying to do is explain something to you and if you would allow me to explain it so you're then, then we will continue person no sir i didn't say that but what i'm trying to explain to you is what the process is this Ms. this Ms. sir Ms. if Mayor, you would allow me the process well 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 see see that's that's okay but what i'm going to explain to you what the presentation is that we have today Mr. if Mayor, you would allow me Mr. just Mayor, one second here i, I know I'm I, I'm not disagreeing with you, yeah. sir. I'm All trying I'm to clarify trying to get something. To some questions about our system to help put us in a better place and not necessarily spend as much money, possibly save money, possibly uh, make things better for the citizens. That's all my questions are, and they are in the line of that. So, S sir, I'm not dis me. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with your questions as it relates to our water system. What I'm trying to convey to you 
in the most appropriate way is this, this presentation that we're having right now and the line of questioning really needs to deal with land use and the development process. That's what they're up here for. So I understand. But, but that's not true. They are a three-pronged situation. He's dealing with storm water management and our water system. He's dealing with the building situation. They were putting a triplex of the services that they provide together. And I wasn't asking the building. I have no problems or, or, or no things that I don't understand about the building situation. I'm just trying to get a better knowledge of this water situation and possibly make things better for the city. And Mr. Mayor, you should know you don't have to explain this to me. I've, I've gone over this several times in my lifetime. Thank you, sir. And, and I believe you have. And may I you, 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 We're going to have one more question well, because we well, need no, to move no, on. Mr. Manager, I Mr. Mayor, I understand. I won't ask him any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Woodard, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, how you doing there, Mr. Doug? Uh, great sure. presentation, uh, great explanation. Uh, Thank you, sir. I just got a question. Uh, is one licensed surveyor enough for our city? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that okay, question. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. L let me get Mr. Wright here. Um, yes, sir, at this time. Um, the one licensed surveyor is enough. Um, that individual, though, um, is nearing the end of his career, which is why, um, if you saw that slide, um, we're we're looking to have an assistant city surveyor come in so we can bridge that gap um, at the at the time he does um, decide to move on. But right now, we're in good shape. Okay, and uh, well, back to Mr. Doug Smith. Um, these are awesome numbers. I think um, a council appreciate what you have going on with the uh, turnaround of uh, permits and applications, um, but. To, to the point of uh, Councilman Wood, Moody, with uh, our large projects coming up like our uh, casino and, and some of the projects that you've done in the past, um, would this put a burden on any of our small businesses that will be trying to go through our application process? Because um, there has been feedback on um, delays and um, them trying to open up small businesses and whatnot. So I don't want to make sure that's a burden to them. So well, are we it, fully staffed and um, um, ready to uh, service our small businesses absolutely um, as a matter of fact one of the um, one of the components of the small business um, small businesses coming into effect here in the city mm -hmm. is a our commercial reinspection program and uh, again uh, as much as I too, too much to my chagrin this was um, um, the turnaround time for those commercial reinspections was way out there. It was probably as long as uh, eight weeks at one time. Right now, we're down to about eight days. Um, so, and I, I think that to your point, the um, the work being done on the cas the casino and so forth uh, will not have any impact whatsoever on on the, on the small business component. Uh, but the commercial reinspection is only one thing. The other was um, plans review for projects where there might be a change of use and something of that nature that required permits to be issued and plans to be reviewed. Uh, we've taken care of that as well, and, and that's part of that timeline dropping dramatically. So I, I'm, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of that. We had some real challenges we had to overcome. Um, but we're there, and, and I can tell you that uh, we couldn't have gotten there without Manager Jones uh, because she, um, she came and, and um, recognized that we had a serious problem there. We had many discussions on it, and we hired the staff that we were able to do, and, and we're developing staff from within. We weren't able to go out and, and bring people in, but we're developing staff from within to fulfill the need. So. And uh, this is for Mr. Wright. Um, I, I know he was talking about a, a streamlined process that was, uh, uh, I guess, beta tested out with the contract in 2019. Um, was there any input from the public or, you know, any other contractors or business owners that was uh, 
that you, why were you guys performing it formulating that um, actual new system? So um, prior to testing with that uh, that that home builder that I mentioned, um, as we were getting getting close to the point where we wanted to do a test, uh, we reached out to all the the surveyors who normally submit single family site plans and invited them to a meeting mm -hmm. after hours so we could get their input um, on the process, what their thoughts were, uh, where they thought, um, what they thought about where we were going with the process. Um, those that could not attend, we um, asked them to provide um, email communication to us so that we could include all those things as we were moving forward in the process. Well, once we got that information, uh, went back to staff and so to speak, put a bow on it. That's when we did the test um, with the with the home builder, um, but not specifically out to the public because uh, typically um, those aren't the people that are submitting through that process. It's those individuals that we that we reached out to that normally make those submissions, and that's why we went that route. Right, right. I, I got you. I just want to make sure you know. Um, that we continue to listen to, you know, the people who are submitting these applications, who are part of this process, because I, I mean, you know, things are ever evolving. So, you know, um, I, I think you guys need to stay on your toes. We want to make sure we stay on our toes as well. Listen to the um, the people who are um, trying to make sure they do a business with our our city, and we want to, you know, stay up, up ahead of the learning curve. So, um, I thank you guys. Uh, I just want to give you that advice because, you know, I do get a lot of phone calls and. And, um, you know, you are the, the professionals, whatnot, and we want to make sure that we are uh, servicing and keeping up with neighboring cities so, you know, we can, um, you know, keep our reputation up to par. So I do appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. There's a lot of good information in the packet that we want to keep close by in case we have to refer back to that. I guess during the pandemic, it would have been a great time for some of these beta testing or some of the streamlining of the processes uh, to consider a digital uh, process or an online process. I'm not sure if any of the departments have an online aspect to any of the processes um, that are in place right now for citizens to be able to utilize that when they can't come into City Hall for options like that. Um, if you can update with that, and then I have one more question relative to Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, I, I don't want to steal the thunder from a, a few of the upcoming slides, but okay. yeah, um, we, we, no one on the fourth floor shut down so um, during the pandemic. So we um, found creative ways to have people drop things off. We have um, a drop box outside of City Hall. Um, we were uh, worked with, um, I think it's the Commissioner of Revenue to allow us to use uh, his Dropbox. And then we do do a number of things electronically that we didn't do in the past. And so those options are available um, to, to applicants, um, whether they um, are seeking information or can't make it to City Hall or, or whatever the case be, or need to make a submission. So those options are available. Great. And then with the, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation um, Area uh, overlay in the district, I know that it was mentioned in, under engineering and it was also mentioned under planning. Were any of those complications or co um, um, problems a c cause for some delays because it may not have been user friendly or somebody might not have understood? I know that during one of our planning meetings, there was a citizen who was trying to build a deck or something and it had to be taken up. So is it user friendly? Do people who are living in Chesapeake Bay preservation areas understand what and what they cannot do that would cause uh, their permits or applications to be denied or delayed? Probably not. I would say that the majority of people who live in a Chesapeake Bay preservation area, unless you're looking at a map, you just know you live on the water. Right. You've been there forever. Those, reg those regulations are relatively new you're talking late 80s so if you've been in the home all your life 70s 60s you've just done whatever you do on the water and, and to, with no thought of whether you need to to contact the city right. for for whatever that's what i'm um, likely mm -hmm. what normally happens is your neighbor reports you and then that's when the city gets involved and tries to basically walk you through the process retroactively um, the reason why that uh, is mentioned in both planning and engineering so um, the use and the, and the land use component um, is handled through the planning department. Um, the technical review um, with the calculations and, and those things as far as the impact the environment 
I handle through the engineering department, and then um, as if a permit is needed as far as land disturbance, that that those inspections and permits that's through the engineering department. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Barnes, sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, to go with Chris' point earlier about involving the, the stakeholders, um, do we have any forums where we're discussing with the the applicants or just the people in general about what they need to do to get a business license, what is needed in a permit? Do we have anything, to, anything like that? Yes. Yes, sir. So, Vice Mayor. So, on each um, of our websites, um, on the planning website, there's a, there's applications. Um, this goes through a slide that you haven't seen yet, but there are applications with links to various city code references. Um, there there are things in place to do pre-application meetings. Um, there are um, requirements and checklists and guides um, for site plan uh, review process for erosion sediment control plans. For Ches Bay process, and so there are a number of uh, guide guidance type materials um, available for applicants on, on the websites, and um, there are a number of different um, groups and individuals that are available that are available to meet with um, applicants to discuss their project and to help them work through the process. So, so for me, um, I get we have it on the on the website, but. You know, a lot of people just don't necessarily know to go to those websites. So for me, I would like to see us maybe do like a monthly forum where we, where we just um, invite people in monthly to kind of talk about these topics and what they need to do to get it done. Um, as far as since the, instead of just doing it to the website, because a lot of times we we got to go to the people and, and and let them and give them that information and kind of coach them up or train them up to get this info. Also, as far as um, inspections, permits. Um, one of the things, and I'm sure we all hear about it, is when we out, we hear about the the issues and when it comes to the inconsistencies and in, um, inspections about how one when a when a when a spec to come in is one criteria for this, and then another one comes in as another criteria, or how when they come in and tell you they need you need to fix something, but then they say this is this it, and then they come back the next time and say well, when you fix this, oh there's something else that needs to be fixed. Um, are we doing a better job with fixing those issues? Are our inspectors trained to actually know what needs to be done, particularly when they go to a certain place or a certain um, business or whatever the case may be? Um, well, you're not sure which type of inspection that you're referring to, so there are a number of different kinds of inspections. So I can only speak to the inspections that come um, through my department. Um, those individuals are trained. Um, they are, um, if you're talking stormwater, they hold various certifications. If you're talking right away, they hold various certifications, and they're all trained um, and, and aware of our guidelines, policies, and procedures for inspections and, and what to look for. Um, if you're sp specifically talking construction sites in the, in the right of way, the inspector goes out and indicates what the um, developer, builder, what have you, um, needs to correct. He's not on site daily, and he has no control of the site. So if something else happens and breaks, um, or, or or gets out of whack while he's not there, um, it's incumbent upon him when he goes back to note that and require that to be corrected when he goes back. So, so. from what what I'm hearing from the business owners, uh, it was a daycare, it was also a car place, restaurant, and, and it's basically all the same thing. Is for instance one one place they it was something in the bathrooms in particular and they had the toilet fixed already and finished but when they came back and they fixed that particular issue when they came back they said the the handle on the toilet was on the wrong side of the toilet but it was like that when they came in the first time and nobody notified them and and, and what this does is creates issues financially when we continue to with our business we continue to tell them stuff um piecemeal and not everything as a whole it makes them lose money and at the end of the day makes them sometimes don't open up. So what we want to do is make sure that we are telling these people this from the beginning so that we can um, really show that we are a small business city and that we um, are welcoming them because a lot of people just don't feel welcome to the process because of the way things are going. I agree with you. Um, and in, these, in some of these instances, as I said earlier, um, some of our staff are relatively new and I like to say they're 
Um, they're not in their infancy in code enforcement, but they are relatively new to it. And the training regimen is detailed. It takes a while. They need to, um, and we need to continue to do a better job with that and continue the rigorous um, um, training that they're getting. Um, but in those cases where there's an inconsistency or something, uh, both the assistant building official and I are ready and willing to have a discussion with any of the business owners to see if we can rectify any of those issues. And if there's um, something that is uh, a relatively minor issue or it can be grandfathered for some reason, we do that. So we do try to, to uh, work with the uh, business owner. So, so what can we do to, to make sure that even though we do have new inspectors, because, again, time is money when it comes to businesses, mm -hmm. what can we do to make sure that when they're going to these businesses, they are um, finding those issues and not having to continue to go back and cost the business owner so much money? Well, the primary thing to do is a good, thorough plans review. And unfortunately, in our commercial reinspection program, uh, the requirement to have a good, clean plan to review has been compromised because of a combination of things. Either we're trying to work with the uh, business owner and we'll allow them to submit something that is far less than what we need, or, um, and then in, in that case, we can't do the detailed type of plan review that we need. So what we're trying to do is, is improve upon that. Because if we can point it out while it's on paper and pencil, it can certainly be, it, it's certainly easier than when it's sticks and bricks. I mean, that's just the fact. And what, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Mia. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Just have a, um, just want to follow up on Mr. Barnes' question. Um, is there an inspection um, document that inspectors use in general? Like a checklist? Right. No, sir. Okay, so when they come to inspect, so it's, it's in their heads already what it is they're looking for and yes, what kind so they have to memorize the inspection book? Well, that's, that, that is what we're asking for them to do, yes. Well, then if we're in the business of customer service, how then will our citizens know what, because there are some things that will fail, there are some things that are commented on yes. that you could still pass. Mm -hmm. How would the average citizen know what's in the inspector's head, the regs? It would seem to me that there should be some type of form that is given in advance that these persons can know that this is what's going to be expected. Mm -hmm. And I know we could say, well, it's in the regulations, it's in uh, the policy, but I think customer service-wise, we need to make something like that available. It's not a surprise inspection. It's, we, we, want, we want the persons to pass. Absolutely, yes, and we do. so did. it shouldn't be closed book, it should be open. And so I think- And I think we can do that, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and and that's something we can improve upon. How how will you how will you um, get back with us on that process of that being done? I think I can. How, uh, Madam City Manager, do you want to address that? Yes, I will definitely be getting back to City Council regarding those processes. That one, the checklist that you're referring to, is one of many processes that we hope to implement to ensure that we're giving information. Um, to our citizens that are trying to do business with, uh, with us, as well as identify some of the issues um, that have created perception. So we will be developing the checklist. The forum idea is a great idea. So as we develop these, we will make sure that we keep the council informed of yeah, those. So any, is, is because Mr. Smith didn't know about a checklist was in the process no, no. of being, okay. So No, I said that's a great idea. Okay, We've had so, talked about that specifically. Okay. All right. Now, the other question I just have, because I thought some of the presentation was going to focus more on the issues that we have heard yeah. uh, coming from uh, constituents about 
fourth floor, and I know it's not scientific. Um, it's just anecdotal. People come up to you. They say how difficult of a process it is going through um, uh, permitting and the cost. Um, my question is, what has specifically been done? Because you, you mentioned that the manager has put some things in place. What, what has specifically been done to address the issues? I thought I heard you mention earlier that you still have a staffing issue. Um, examiners, I, I heard you mention that. What, what has specifically been done to address logistically? Do we just go to one floor and get your permits? Do they have to go to different offices? Is it a one-stop shop? What, what's being done in that regard? Well, the entire, the entire permit process is what we've been trying to um, highlight here. There is the planning and the zoning well, component. Well, I'm you, sorry. You, you've, you've been highlighting um, what the departments are made of. I'm talking the logistics of it. The average person comes in to get a permit. Where do they go? Do they have to go to two locations, one location? One location, do we have enough staffing? Because if not, that becomes a budget issue that we need to address. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm concerned to do. The general overview and that information here, that may be good, but it doesn't address the concern. And, and that is the issue of what's going on on the fourth floor customer service wise uh, with getting permits in a timely manner and without having these additional costs. So, so what has specifically been done? Well, specifically with regards to the turnaround time for uh, for plans review, uh, plans have to come in um, and be dropped off for review. That's one of the ideas that one of the problems that we've had is the turnaround time with that. Mm -hmm. But specifically, we hired, we contracted with a third party, a plans examiner company. We hired two new plans examiners. We, I believe that we do have the staff for that now. Um, the process of issuing permits is simply uh, it depends it's probably depending on the permit is in uh, maybe 30 minutes we have the number of uh, permit technicians that we need and then performing the inspections we have that staff so now let me ask you this when you say you've had a third party plan examiner is that what you you said a third yes sir party plan a, a, a company that performs third-party plans exam. Right. So now, as far as time-wise, are you finding that that has now expedited the turnaround? Or that has or? helped us, yes. Um, for example, their turnaround time by in our contract is uh, two weeks, and which we've reduced our turnaround time to that point now as well. So, mm -hmm. I, and, and maybe I wasn't clear there. Um, our our third parties turnaround time is two weeks, but the planned review that we do as well in-house is also two weeks. Mm -hmm. And this, let's go, I know we have a closed session. Do, do, we, have, do we have a uh, survey or that the contractors do to critique or uh, address issues within the process? Is there some type of survey that they conduct or questionnaire that the department issues? Uh, we haven't had one in uh, several years, but I'm sure we can come up with that, something. I mean, like that, that might be something good so that we yes, can have some critique. Are you complete, sir? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, um, did you have anything additional, Mr. Smith? No, I, I think there were some additional slides, perhaps. Were we done with the slides? Mr. Mayor, in the interest of time, because we have a closed session that we have some issues that we really need to address, um, can if there's some other issues, Council has, can they bring that up on the um, on the agenda during the regular meeting if that's okay with Council? I will pose that as as um, a consensus to Council. Um, there is another another presentation on the agenda which deals with pavilion management. 
if there are no, um, can I see a show of hands from a consensus if we want to move forward with moving toward the closed session? Yeah. It looks like there's enough for us to postpone these other presentations. Madam City Manager, the pavilion presentation. Yes. And also, we've completed the land use and development process. So we will be moving um, f into our closed session with a motion. But before we get there, um, on behalf of, of, of the City Council, I want to thank you all for the comprehensive proposal that you've presented to us and the work that you've done. Obviously, with the manager and the team, you all have put in a lot of effort and thought into improving the process. I think the recommendations from my colleagues on council were very well uh, indicated, and we look forward to some of those things being added to make it a better experience for our business owners and our citizens. So thank you again for all your hard work. And Mr. Mayor, before we read the uh, closed session motion, I just want to, um, for Attorney Stromberg, um, the specific issue that you have in the motion, there are also other settlement issues other than just the monument protest. Can, can that language be added and other settlement issues? Would that still be consistent with the code that's referenced? That, that would be fine. I, I'm not exactly sure which cases you're talking about. But I well, any we're... cases that we've discussed um, previously other than just monument cases. All right. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that would be fine to amend the motion to include other in cases. other settlement. Uh, how should that in other? Uh, other litigation. Other litigation. Um, do we need to have that in writing before we move forward? I, I okay, very good. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, Dr. Whitaker, sir, could you read the motion? Okay. I move to go into closed meeting uh, A pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A.7 for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the city specifically regarding events related to the monument protests and other litigation issues. B, pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A.3 for the purpose of discussing and disposition of publicly held real estate, real property, where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body, specifically regarding 700 Crawford Street. Do we have a second? And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Battle. Yes. Mrs. Lucasburg. Yes. Mr. Moody. Yes. Dr. Whitaker. Yes. Mr. Woodard. Yes. Mayor Glover. Yes. We're in closed session. Before we start the meeting, we have a motion. We need a motion to come out of closed. Yes. I hereby move that each council member certify that to the best of his or her knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Thank you, sir. Second. We need a second. Second. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Battle. Yes. Mrs. Lucas Burke. Yes. Mr. Moody. Yes. Dr. Whitaker. Yes. Mr. Woodard. Yes. Mayor Glover. Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm.